be live now. So we're back in the pavilion at Spruce Creek Acres in the Big South Fork in Jamestown, Tennessee. I'm glad to have those that have ventured out on this. I'm being told it's called Whippoorwill Winter. And uh, so it would be a cool, crisp, uh, chilly morning on the first day back in this open air pavilion. But uh, that's all right. We're here. And uh, we will uh, uh, carry on. And, and uh, again, we said that we've got one more winter, a blackberry winter to go. So we'll see how that goes. All right. Uh, but again, good to have those who are with us today here in the pavilion. We have several here, and good to have those of you who are on look at Facebook Live and listen later on YouTube. We appreciate all of you, and I uh, do appreciate uh, Dave Coker for his part in doing that. Uh, Dave sent me a uh, uh, microphone that's supposed to hook up with my telephone to help make sure that the, the recording gets uh uh, proper audio and, and enough volume, and so I've got to put that thing on a test run over here and see how that works, and then, of course, we've got our other sound equipment to get set up, but we didn't do that this morning, hoping, expecting a small crowd, and then uh, uh, hoping that I'd be able to project loud enough that you're able to hear, and that the video and audio will pick up there on the phone. All right, very good. This morning, if you will, turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. That's where we're going to start. We've got two or three places to go, and, and if I don't run out of time during my introduction, then uh, uh, we'll, we'll hit two or three places, and then we'll spend some time in the book of Romans. Uh, but the title of the message this morning is real simple, One. Uh, we're going to look at the word one uh, in... Uh, not all of the places where the word one is used, obviously that's going to be used a lot, but we want to look at some specific places where Paul, our apostle, used the word one and talk about the significance of the word. As I did my search and was doing my study, of course, uh, I go into my phone app and I put quotation mark one and write it out, close quotation marks, and I do the search. I got 1,695 times the word one is used in our Bible. And uh, 1,154 of those times is in the Old Testament. 541 are in the New Testament. <coughs> and so uh, aren't you glad we're not going to preach through the word one from Genesis to Revelation? Uh, and we're not even going to preach through the word one as it's used by Paul in his 13 epistles. Uh, but I do want to hit a couple of specific places this morning, again, by way of introduction, and not that one is any more important than the other, but just some things that I want to make sure that we don't miss out on, and, uh, and then uh, we'll see how far we're able to go uh, as we carry on this study. When we use the word one, then, of course, first of all, it's the idea of singular, one thing, one person, one act. Well, you know, one is a singular type word. But we also use the word one when it's a reference to many coming together and being united. And so when many join together and are united, they become one. Uh, my wife and I have been married in December of this year. It'll be 48 years. And uh, most of you who know us have been around us you think of us as one. It's Sam and Debbie. You don't just think of Sam. You don't just think of Debbie because we go together. We are two that have become one. And so it's a singular thing, Sam and Debbie. You go find Erica and Dewey on Facebook. It's Erica and Dewey. One word. <laughs> Erica and Dewey are one. And so we think of each other in that way in our relationships. And so uh, singular, one, or many coming together united is also one. And we'll see that as the way it's used by Paul in several places. But we're going to start in 1 Corinthians 12 this morning just to jump in this thing. We're going to read several verses here and then uh, come back and make some comments. But as we read through, I want you to notice the word one as we go through. And again, if y'all around me very much, you know I'm a word chaser. 
a word come to my mind and I chase that word. It's interesting to me to do that. And so we're going to begin here at 1 Corinthians 12, beginning at verse 4. We're going to read through verse 27. Now, the, now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Again, 1 Corinthians 12, 4. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. And that's important for me as we just read through that and come back and say, this is a good definition of rightly dividing the word of truth. This is a good way to go in and understand that phrase we use all the time, that God told different people different things at different times. Because there's diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There's differences of administrations, but the same Lord. There are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. So again, that's a description of God's deeds with mankind through the ages. All right, verse 8 now. 4 to 1 is given by the Spirit, the word of wisdom to another one, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit to another one, faith by the same Spirit to another one, the gift of healing by the same Spirit to another one, and you know I'm inserting that there because the way it started, 4 to 1 is given, and so I'm just kind of carrying that thought through. Again, verse 9, to want to another one, faith by the same Spirit, to another one, the gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another one, the working of miracles, to another one, prophecy, to another one, this discerning of spirits, to another one, diverse kinds of tongues, to another one, the interpretation of tongues. And uh, it's a whole message about those things that are in there that were a part of the function of Paul's early ministry when he was going to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so 1 Corinthians written during that period of time, so Paul references those things, and it's another study for me to come back and talk about, it. well, why don't we have all of those things that we just read about today? Well, there's a reason for it, a scriptural, doctrinal reason, but it's a study for another day. All right, so we carry on. Verse 11. But all these worketh that one and selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. And here's where I want to get as we begin at verse 12. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. And so there's the word one used, what, three times in one verse. So when I gave those numbers a while ago, that's how many verses that the word one is used. Sometimes that word one is used twice or three times or four times in all those verses. All right, verse 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. And so he talks about there the body of Christ, and he's making a reference. That one body is the body of Christ, the church which is his body. No one talked about the body of Christ until the Apostle Paul. No one made a reference to the church which is his body until the Apostle Paul. So this is one of those unique doctrines to for about the church, the body of Christ today. And so Paul begins to lay this thing out. That there's one body, it has many members. Well, that's one of our de de definitions of one. It's, it's many coming together and being united. So that's the body of Christ. And so he goes on to say, uh, verse 13, and I want to emphasize that, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Now don't read the word water baptized into that. Because there's no water in the book of 1 Corinthians there at all in that sense. He says, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. And so we're all familiar with that scene of a water baptism. And so you've got to say, let's picture John the Baptist out there in the River Jordan. And by one, John the Baptist, he baptizes them into the River Jordan, into that water, right? 
And so we have that picture, and you picture the preacher uh, in that baptistry up behind the pulpit, behind the flat, behind the platform there. And you've got that preacher, that pastor who is standing in the water in his in his frog digging boots. And uh, he and he takes that person that's in there and he dunks them in the water and comes up. Or you think about that little <clears throat> column or stand over on the side of the platform and oh yeah, I'm getting out of my vision, aren't I? Thank you. All right, that folks helping me stay within the camera. <laughs> so so you get that uh, you get that little column right there and uh, it's got that bowl of water. And, uh, you know, they take that bowl of water and they take their hands and they sprinkle it or they splash it or whatever it is they do with it. So you think about that when you think about baptism. So take that same image now and apply it to verse 13. And he says, for by one spirit are we all. And so he's talking about those of us who are individual members of the body of Christ. So who's doing the baptizing in verse 13? The spirit is, not a preacher. Not a priest, not not John the Baptist, but it's a it's it's the one Spirit who does the baptizing. So when you have that image in your mind and you see a preacher or a priest or whatever it is you see from your religious background, and you think about baptism, instead of seeing that preacher or that priest there, see the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God there. And He says, "For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body." Does it say anything about water there? No. And so the Spirit is baptizing into the body of Christ. And so when you see the preacher baptizing into water, now see it as the Holy Spirit of God baptizing or placing us into the body of Christ. I hope that taking time to pull that out helps you to understand it. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into that one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore out of the body? Or if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now, hath God, that's always an important word to pay attention to, right? Paul writes, he says, but now, in other words, things might have been different in the past, but now, here's how they are. But now, hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body is it that pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. And so the many members of the body are brought together by the Spirit when he places each individual believer into the church, the body of Christ. All right, he carries on. Verse 21, The eye cannot say unto the hand, I am no need of thee, nor again the head to the to the feet, uh, I have no need of you. Nay, much more, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these uh, we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. Now, I know there's folks who think differently about some of these things, but, but you know, think about, think about your feet. Your feet are ugly. My feet are ugly. And the older we get, the uglier our feet get. And so when you think about that, well, are the feet part of the body? Yes. Do they have a real important function? Yes. And so the whole idea there is, is every individual member made a part of the body they all have an important function. They all have an important place. They all make up and coming together form that one body from head to foot. And so that's the whole idea there. I saw a meme came up on Facebook memories the last couple of days. 
And it said, it was back, it was a meeting from back during COVID. And it said, okay, folks. I think it may have said girls or something. But it said, okay, girls. If you're ugly, but you have real pretty eyes, now's your time to shine. Because <laughs> you're putting that mask on me. <laughs> girls, if you're ugly, but you got real pretty eyes, now's your time to shine. And so again, we identify things that are ugly or things that are attractive in our own eyes and our own mind, and yet as he uses the analogy of the body to talk about the church, the body of Christ, in which we are, he's talking about that. Some of those things are not as comely as others. Some are not as beautiful as others, but every one of those is needed. So he goes on in verse 25, for our comely parts... For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that parts which lack. And so the idea there, our comely parts have no, does it matter if your face is pretty or your face is ugly? You still got a face, right? It doesn't matter if your ears are nice and where they're supposed to be, if your ears stick out like an elephant. It doesn't matter if you have one of those noses that they might use at a plastic surgeon's office as a pattern. Or if you got one of them great big noses, it feels the whole place. In other words, it's not the attractiveness of the thing, but it's the usefulness and it's the purpose of the thing that is the value. And so we carry on now. Uh, read verse 24 again. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that parts which lack, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should give have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now, ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. So there it is. Ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And that's true of the body of Christ at large. It's also true, as Paul writes to this church at Corinth, specific, that local assembly, and then through application of the scripture, Paul writing to a local church, then that also he's writing to us as a local assembly, a body of believers here. And so the same thing true that he says there at verse 24, 25, 26, 27 there, is true about us as a local body of believers. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Verse 28. Nope, I'm going to stop at verse 27. All right, but that's where I wanted to go to talk about one. All right? And if I go further, I want to chase those rabbits. And so first of all, I wanted to talk about the significance of the word one as it has to do with our relationship with Christ and who we are as members of the church the body of Christ, and then how that has to do with our relationship with one another within this local church, this local assembly, this local visible body of Christ. We are members of the body of Christ. Sometimes, I'm going to say it like this, and I think you'll know as I carry on with it, but uh, anybody, regardless of, of where they go to church, of what doctrine they're involved in, any individual person who had at one point, at one time in their life, placed their faith in the finished work of Christ alone, that he died on that cross for their sins, was buried and raised again for their justification. They're not trusting any religious act that they would do. They're trusting in the finished work of Christ alone for their salvation. They're not trusting in uh, baptism. They're not trusting in, in church membership. Everybody's phones are going off. There must be an Amber Alert. Or there something. is. Okay. All right. And so uh, there you go. All right. And so so regardless of, of, of any religious act that they did or whatever, they're trusting in the finished work of Christ alone. Then 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13 applies to, to them. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. And so when we think about the church, the body of Christ, uh, at large, we think about the church, the body of Christ, from Paul to the rapture, 
than anybody, everybody who's ever placed their faith in the finished work of Christ alone is a member of the church, the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. And we need to understand that. They're all members of the church, the body of Christ. Now again, their doctrine may be fouled up in a lot of areas. They may have been caught up in some uh, religious uh, uh, situation where they were taught the wrong things. But if at any point they trusted Christ, then 1 Corinthians 12, 13 took place in their life. And trusting Christ alone as their Savior, the Spirit of God placed them, baptized them into the body of Christ. Amen? And then, bring it back here local, each one of you who come, you identify, and if somebody says, where do you go to church? Well, you know, I go to the Bible Believers Cowboy Ministries. That's my church. And so you identify with this local assembly as we gather here together. And so not only are you members of the church, the body of Christ at large, but you're also members of the Bible Believers Cowboy Ministries simply because you placed your faith in Christ and you've chosen to gather and identify us here with us here in this local body. Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. And so then as we read through here then, then we know that we should have a care and a concern and a burden and be prayerful for those within the church, the body of Christ. Amen? All right. So now, go with me now to Ephesians. Like I said, I'll probably get through my introduction, I hope, and then I'll be running out of time, but we'll see. So we're going from 1 Corinthians 12, we're baptized by the Spirit into the body, and now we're going to Ephesians chapter 4. As we go to Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to read, uh, beginning at verse 1, we're going to read, first of all, 1 through 7 of Ephesians chapter 4. Paul says in Ephesians 4, beginning at verse 1, he says, Therefore, excuse me, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation for which you are called. Now again, Paul's writing to a church in Ephesus. So he's writing to a local assembly of believers in Ephesus. He's writing to folks who, according to 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, have been baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ, right? He's talking to a group of folks there in Ephesus, just like he was talking to a group of folks in Corinth, just like he would be talking to this group of folks right here in the pavilion at Spruce Creek Acres in the big South Fork. Uh, so he's talking to that group of folks and he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation for which ye are called. And so a vocation has to do with an occupation, doesn't it? So he says, walk worthy of the vocation for which ye are called. And I would throw out, just in passing, that our vocation, according to 2 Corinthians 5, is that we are ambassadors of Christ with the ministry of reconciliation, okay? I would also back up here to Ephesians 3 and say, not only are we ambassadors of Christ with the ministry of reconciliation, but we also uh, have the task of, as Paul talked about over there, let's see, beginning at verse, uh, uh, this just came to my mind, but where I want to go. Uh, why would I do that? I'm reading down through Ephesians 3. And I want to find the... You get it verse 6. That the, Ephesians 3, 6. That the Gentiles should be made fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God <coughs> given unto me by the effectual working of the power Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Now here's where I want to get to, verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. And so we have that twofold commission that's given to us, that, that vocation, as he talks about Ephesians 4, 1, that's been given to us. First, the ministry of reconciliation. Telling folks that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. 
For he, the Father, made him, the Son, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In other words, preaching the gospel of the grace of God to others. That's our ministry as ambassadors. But our ministry also, as added to that, as Paul wrote Ephesians, is that we make all men see what is the fellow, what is the uh, fellowship of the mystery, verse 9. Uh, yeah, to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. In other words, it's going not only from that all men be saved, but that all men come unto the knowledge of the truth of the word of God as presented by our Apostle Paul. So we carry on now. Verse 1 again of Ephesians 4. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation, for with you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Now notice those words there. With all lowliness and meekness and long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Look, you know those are, those those things sometimes are hard to put in good way. You know. So as we carry out the ministry of reconciliation, as we carry out the ministry, the mystery of. Uh, the, the ministry of making all men see the fellowship of the mystery. As we do that, as we carry out the vocation, we're to do it with all lowliness and meekness and long suffering and forbearing and, uh, and doing that to one another in love. That's important. I'm glad that there were folks when they first approached me with the truth of the gospel and the rightly divided word of truth that they were long-suffering. Because we all admit, when we first began to hear some of these things, our religious pride and our religious indoctrination kind of got the cockles up on the back of our heads. Now, I, I ain't never heard that in my whole life. That sounds crazy. And so we have to be patient, long-suffering, lowly, meekness, and then we have to be forbearing. I'm thankful for those who've been forbearing and treating me that way. Now he goes on, verse 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So again, an endeavoring. That takes a little effort, doesn't it? That's, that's an on-purpose kind of thing. So he says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit, capital S, in the bond of peace. Goes on now, we're all focusing on those words one. He says, There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called, and one hope of your calling. So that one body is the body of Christ. That one body is that body of Christ that's made up of those Jews and Gentiles, those Jews and Greeks who first come to faith in the gospel of Christ. As Paul was doing the missionary journeys and going into the synagogues, going to the Jew first and also to the Greek, and that one body is also made up of those pagan wild dog Gentiles that came to faith under the gospel of the grace of God that was preached by Paul after he got to Rome and continued his ministry to those Gentiles. And so you've got that one body of Christ. There's one body. Anybody and everybody that was saved from the from Paul the Apostle's salvation in Acts chapter 9 to the rapture, the catching away of the church, the body of Christ, anyone who's been saved by the grace of God, saved under the gospel that the ascended Lord Jesus Christ gave to the Apostle Paul, regardless of their background, regardless of their religious heritage, regardless of where they come from, they're all made apart, whether they were in the place of promise and blessing or whether they were outside the place of promise and blessing whether they were in the covenants of Israel or outside the covenants of Israel, if they came to faith in that Christ died for their sins, was buried and raised again for their justification, they're all made a part of that one body. And that's the emphasis Paul's making here in the book of Ephesians as he goes through these things, beginning at verse 4. There's one body. There's one spirit, one Holy Spirit. It's that Holy Spirit that baptizes us into the body of Christ. It's that Holy Spirit that Paul wrote about in Ephesians chapter 1 that's, that, is, that is given to us as the earnest of our redemption. 
It's given that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. It, uh, it's the Holy Spirit that guarantees the security of our eternal salvation. Because we're not only are we baptized by the Spirit into the body, but that Spirit seals us in that body. In other words, once you're in, you can't get out no matter how hard you try. Because you're sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. So there's one body and one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling. Well, we know that the hope of our calling is that one day we're going to leave this old nasty flesh and we're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord and we're going to have a heavenly body fitted and, and, and designed and put together in such a way that it can live in the heavenly places through all eternity. That's our hope. Our hope is the glory of God that we shall be like him and have a body like his. That's the one hope of our call. We all have that hope as members of the church, the body of Christ. Verse 5, there's one Lord. There's one faith. There's one baptism. One Lord, that's the Lord God Almighty. One Lord, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. There's one Lord. He's the Lord of the, the Jew in the synagogue back there in the first century that heard Paul. He's the, he's the Lord of the, of the Greek in the synagogue back there that heard Paul. And he's the Lord of the pagan, idolatrous Gentile that came to faith in Christ later. And he's our Lord. All of, he's the Lord of all of us who are members of the church, the body of Christ. There's one Lord. It's not different lords. He says there's one faith. That one faith, that one body of truth. Now, it's, uh, I got, it's a faith of Christ, and it's that one body of truth that because of the work of the faith of Christ, he presented to our Apostle Paul. One faith. And there's one baptism. And that baptism has nothing to do with water. It has everything to do with that baptism of 1 Corinthians 12, 13. By one spirit, we're all baptized into the body of Christ. There's one baptism. You don't get to the, you don't need today to be baptized in water, and then after that to get baptized with the Holy Ghost, and then to be baptized, you know, whatever and whatever. There's not multiple baptisms today in the church, the body of Christ, of which we're a part today. There's one baptism, and that's that baptism by the Spirit into the church, the body of Christ. I've heard preachers preach on this. And and they they say there's one baptism and then they start talking about all the different baptisms you gotta have. Well, wait a minute, that's one, and that's one, and that's one, and they're not all the same. There's one baptism. That's another thing I need to <coughs> spend time here. Verse six says there's one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. One God and Father of all. Well, why is that significant as Paul writes Ephesians? Because do you realize in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, well, even go back, do you, do you realize from the time that God called Abram out of Ur of the Chaldees, and Abram became that first Hebrew, he became that first Jew, and then through his seed, all through the Old Testament, into Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, do you know who God was the father of? The nation of Israel. If a Gentile referred to God as the, their father, those Jews wouldn't like that. He's our father. And as Paul conducted his ministry and brought folks into faith through the gospel of Christ, the gospel of the grace of God, then he's able to write here in Ephesians uh, verse four, chapter 4, verse 6, there's one God and father of all. The not matter who you are. You place your faith in Christ and you are a member of that one body and you're a partaker of that one spirit and you have that same one hope and you have the one Lord and you have the one faith and you have the one baptism, then you also are a part of the one God and Father of all. He's not just the God of Israel. He's the God of you and me. He's the God of all who have come to him by faith. You remember back there in Matthew 6 when Jesus taught the 12 how to pray? And how'd that thing start? 
Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Well, again, just go right back there. That's Jesus teaching the 12 apostles and then the people of Israel how to pray. And how did they pray? They prayed our Father because he was the Father of Israel. I'm glad to know that in verse 6 of Ephesians 4, he's one God and Father of all. He's our Father. It says, who is above all and through all and in you all. But to every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So again, do you see the importance of the word one here in this part of Ephesians 4? Focusing on that one. I like verse 7 again. I like all of it. But as we, as we finish this particular part, he says, verse 7, but unto every one of us is given grace. Now folks, that ought to be comfort right there. Unto every one of us is given grace according to how much we learned it? According to how properly we've lived? According to how we've avoided the don'ts and been faithful to do the do's. He says every one of us to every one of us is given every one of us is given grace, not according to what we do, but according to what? According to the measure of the gift of Christ. I don't know if this is a proper example, but, but I'm going to tell you the old heathen boy that I was at 15 when God extended his grace and saved me, that was a measure of grace that he extended to me that I needed. Amen? And wherever you were, and God extended his grace to you, it went far enough, it went deep enough, it went so it was sufficient enough that that measure of the gift of Christ, according to that that grace that was given out to you, that measure that was given out to you, it was, it was enough for you. So he says, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. I know how much grace they need, and I'm going to give them all that they need. Ain't that good to know? And, and that's to every one of us. All right, now, staying in Ephesians 4, let me watch my time. Okay, I'm doing good. <laughs> Ephesians 4, uh, pick up verse 25, and we're going to look here a little more at the word 1 in Ephesians 4. Let me see how far I'm supposed to go. Watch my notes. Notes are a good guy. Okay, I'm good. Go to the end of the chapter. All right, so Ephesians 4, beginning at verse, what did I say? 25. Ephesians 4, 25. Uh, he picks up and says, Wherefore, put him away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. You see how that theme goes all the way through there? All the way back in 1 Corinthians 12, we're made members, <coughs> we're members one of another when we were baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. And so again, he's writing to this local church at Ephesus. So we know he's talking to them, but by extension he's talking to us as a local church. So again, verse 25, wherefore putting away lying, Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Now, we ought to do that with the community at large, but we especially ought to do that with one another. Amen? All right, he carries on. Verse 26. Be ye angry, and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Well, now, let's think about that one a minute. Is it okay to be angry according to that verse? Yes. Are we even instructed to be angry according to that verse? Mm -hmm. He says, be angry and sin not. Well, I'm glad to know that the Lord knows we all have a tendency from time to time to get angry. But the admonition here is to be angry and to sin not. He goes on to say, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. What's that mean? Don't go to bed mad. 
Be ye angry, sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. That's especially true at my house when my wife is mad at me. <laughs> she said, she said <laughs> I can't imagine why she'd ever be mad at me. <laughs> but you know, whatever fuss we may have had, whatever disagreement we may have had, it kills me to go to bed and her be mad at me. It just kills me. I'm going to do anything and everything I can to make peace before we go to bed. But sometimes it makes me more mad. Because <laughs> I'm trying to make peace. I, I, want, I want a kiss goodnight. And if she's mad at me, I don't get that kiss goodnight. I can come and want to kiss her on the lips or goodnight. Not some big old hot passionate kiss. Just a little peck on the, kick, on the lips. And, and if she's still mad at me, she turns her face. That may be TMI. I don't know. Yeah, she's, she's mad now. Yeah, she's mad now. Wait till you get home. Until it's early in the day. I've got all that on there. Yeah, you can make it up. There's Be angry. I'm going to do all. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. And so. Deal with it, put it behind you, move on. Now, one of our Debbie and I's uh, mentors from our youth was Bill Lester Oloff, and I heard Bill Oloff preach this one time, and and uh, I, I don't know that he had it right, but it's a whole different take on how you understand the verse. He said, be ye angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. He, and I got it written in the margin of my Bible what Bill Oloff said. He said, get mad at the devil and sin and just stay mad. And when he saw his, his idea was, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Just because the sun goes down, don't get over being mad at the devil and sin. <laughs> now again, I'm not sure that's the right way to take that. But he preached it that way one time. I, I wrote it in the margin of my Bible. Get mad at the devil. Uh, uh, get mad at the devil and sin and stay mad at the devil and sin. Don't let the sun go down because you get over being mad at the devil and sin. Now, again, I'm not sure that's how well I look at that. That's the way to go. I'll preach it at least in that one message. Verse 27. Neither give place to the devil. So that kind of goes together. you got that colon at the end of verse 26. And so the end of that sentence is, be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Don't let the devil take up residence in your heart, in your mind, in your life. Be angry, but don't sin, and don't let the devil take up residence. Okay? Carry on. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his own hands. Uh, work. Is that how it says? I'll turn the page too quick. Working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that need it. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying that may minister grace unto the ear. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But the communication that proceeds out of your mouth ought to be that which is good to the use of edification, building up. Never heard your grandma say, or your mama say, you can't say something nice. Don't say it at all. Don't say it at all. Some days that's more difficult than others, isn't it? Yep. And it says that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Verse 30 is where we're trying to get to now, 30, 31, 32. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So, again, don't, don't miss out the last part of the verse. You're sealed into the day of redemption by the Holy Ghost, by the Spirit of God, by the Holy Spirit of God. But he says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Now, what does that mean? That means when you hear and know and understand the truth from Scripture, it grieves the Holy Spirit of God when you know the truth, you know what the Scripture says, even as we've been reading this, and yet you rebel and you refuse to submit. When we rebel and refuse to submit ourselves to the truth of the Word of God, to the truth of Scripture, that grieves the Holy Spirit of God. And so it says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness 
and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Now verse 32. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Well, there's that one again and again. He's writing to this church, the church in Ephesus, and then by extension to us as members of this church here. And so he says, and be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And again, that's an important dispensational thing. We referred to Matthew 6 back there a while ago. And if you read through that, what's called the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, it gets down to that place and it says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now what that prayer says is, Lord, when I forgive others, then you forgive me. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive others. Well, the implication there is then, if we don't forgive others, we don't get forgiveness. That's not what Paul tells us in Ephesians 4.32, is it? What he says there is just the opposite. Under the earthly ministry of Christ, too far about the nation of Israel, it was, if you want forgiveness, you've got to get, you've got to give forgiveness. If you want forgiveness from God, you've got to give forgiveness to others if you're going to get that forgiveness from God. Here it says, be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, not in order to get forgiveness, but because you already have it. Forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. How could God forgive us for Christ's sake? He was delivered for all offenses. He died shedding his blood for our sins. And he did that when? <laughs> 2,000 years ago. And so he says there then, we're to be kind, <coughs> tenderhearted, and forgive one another, not because we want forgiveness, but because we already have. And that's an important thing to get a hold of. Forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath. The word hath is a past tense idea. It hath forgiven you. I've got one more place in about five or six minutes. And that'll be the introduction. <laughs> First Timothy, and that's all you're going to get today is the, is the introduction. First Timothy, chapter 2. We'll wrap it up with this this morning. First Timothy chapter 2. Begin at verse 1. We're going to read down through verse 6. First Timothy 2 verse 1 through verse 6. I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Sometimes that's hard to do. For kings and for all that are in authority, that we may live a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Verse 4. Who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the one man. Christ Jesus. Now that's good news. And listen, that wrecks a whole lot of religious theology on certain circles, doesn't it? There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. I don't see Mary in there anywhere. I don't see St. Christopher in there anywhere. I don't see any of those other quote-unquote saints in there anywhere. We don't pray to the patron saint of, right? You know why we don't? Because there's one God and one mediator between God and men, and that one mediator between God and men is the man Christ Jesus. Verse 6, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Who did Jesus die for? All. Who was he a ransom for? All. 
And when Peter and them preached about the death of Christ back there, they said he was a ransom for many. Paul comes along with further revelation and he said he wasn't just a ransom for many, he was a ransom for all. What's that mean? That means he paid the ransom. He, what's the ransom? The wages of sin is death. He paid the ransom. He paid the wages. And he paid it for how many? All. You mean that lost guy up the road or down the trail or on the backside of Spruce Creek or wherever it may be, wherever it might be, uh, uh, somebody in our family or somebody that we know off out there in the distance somewhere, you mean that Jesus was a ransom for that scoundrel? Yeah, he was. He's a ransom for all. Does that mean that person's going to heaven? No. Does that mean they've been baptized by the Spirit into the body? No. Does that mean they have the one hope and one faith and one baptism and the one God and one Father and the one Lord and, and you know, all, does that mean they have all that? No, but it certainly means that the ransom is paid and all they need to do is believe the gospel, to trust Christ because sin is not in the way anymore. Well, like I said, we've just given an introduction to the idea of one and, and I'll be prayerful this week and do I want to come back and carry it and make it a part two and take care of the rest of my notes that I have there to start with. But I think you understand the idea that the word one uh, has some significance as we read through Paul's epistles. It has some significance as it relates to us and our relationship with one another, our relationship with God and God's relationship to us. And so, boy, that about trumps us everything, doesn't it? One. Very important word. I appreciate your attention this morning. And uh, come back next week to see if we carry on and make this a part two. Thank you.